someone is returning. He started his own media company and now he's back. Who could it be? I'll give you a hint. He's a man. A man you have missed with all your heart. A man who has ruined all other men for you. Who is it? Who is it? It's Tony Merkel. Merkel Media. This was all circulating around the base that a giant had been killed, but no one was supposed to talk about it. I saw three long bony fingers reach up underneath the door, curl up to grab it, and then disappear. When he came over to me, dude, he slithered over to me. And this giant comes out of the cave and they're all frozen. And he starts running and firing at this giant. Well, the giant moves. He's got a spear in one hand and he's running really fast and spears Dan and holds him up like this. Somebody yells, shoot him in the face, shoot him in the face. They basically decapitate him. Got closer, got closer, got closer. When he got about 15 yards away from me, I raised that 12 gauge and I blow this head off. I feel something pulling at my leg. And I look over and there are two small gray entities pulling at me. And they're literally, I'm getting pulled off the bed. I reached my hand into this bush and I touched air. Couldn't breathe and I couldn't move because I know I'm seeing a monster. Yep. yep. Welcome to the show, everybody. You're listening to the Confessionals Podcast. I'm your host, Tony Merkel. Thanks for being here. If you have a crazy, wild experience you want to share with me on the show, go ahead and shoot me an email. My email address is contact at theconfessionalspodcast.com. That's contact at theconfessionalspodcast.com. Or go to the website, theconfessionalspodcast.com. Hit the contact section and you can reach me that way as well. Either way works for me, just get a hold of me. If you get a hold of me and you get on the show, your story might become a documentary featured through Merkel Media. We've done two documentaries released already. We have three in the bank and we're ready to do more. So shoot us an email if you want your story to become a feature film or documentary. Now, moving on here, if you want more shows on a weekly basis, go to theconfessionalspodcast.com, hit the join button, and become a member. Members get access to Thursday shows, which are members exclusive for the past, present, and future broadcasts. You get access to the Tuesday shows ad-free and overtime segments when they are available, all exclusive on the website, theconfessionalspodcast.com, and the Confessionals member appy. So if you want more of that extra good good, go check it out, The Confessionals podcast.com slash join. Now, I hope you guys had a great holiday season. I hope you enjoyed the guest host we had on the show. Thank you very much to Cryptids of the Corn and Joel Thomas for hosting the show the last two weeks. It was a much needed break for me and my family. The first time I took time off in seven years from the show, and it will be another seven years till I leave again. I'm here forever, friends. All right, today we got Walter Bosley on the show. He is a returning guest When we had him on the first time, it was a fantastic conversation, but there was just not enough time to talk to him about everything. So I brought him back on to talk about his research into Disneyland and how Disneyland was specifically designed with intent to possibly open portals into other realms and universes. Uh, That's more my words than Walter's, but nevertheless, there definitely is a thinning of the veil at this location, and there was a device used that possibly could have been opening portals, and Walter himself might have been subject to such an occasion. So let's get to Walter and his experience and research into Disneyland's portal device right now. All right, today we have returning guest, Walter Bosley. Sir, how are you? Doing great, Tony. It's good to be back. I'm glad you're here. 
Uh, so last time you were on the show, we were talking about a bunch of funky stuff. We were talking about David Grush mm -hmm. and the UFO documents coming out. Are you still rolling your yeah. eyes about David Grush? <laughs> you know, I'll tell you what. Last time you were on the show, uh, the people mm -hmm. people were listening. I don't know if they were watching, but they could hear your eyes rolling. <laughs> and and, and I, I don't know if they were too happy about your eye rolls. But you know what? Well, as, per, can... as per tradition on the show, I let the guests speak their mind. So, you know, whether, whether people like it or not, it's just, it is what it is. But here's the thing. People, people want, uh -huh. they, they, they want the excitement, you know, they, they, they like the fact that there's this whole disclosure thing and, you know, David Grush is this whistleblower and he's the, guy, the hot word whistleblower, you know, and they don't want to hear anybody talk down about the whistleblower, you know, that's why Edward Snowden's still popular because he's the whistleblower man. So yeah, he's way more of the real thing. Than, uh, <laughs> yeah. I was, see, see, I was testing <laughs> you there. More. I was testing you there. I figured, let me throw out Edward Snowden, yeah. if, and, and if if he says that you know Snowden's a, a fraud too, then the people who were saying you were an inside no. agent were correct. <laughs> no, Edward Snowden's the very real thing, and and for 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 that matter, really. Wouldn't uh, you know? Isn't Gary McKinnon also? Yeah, right. Do I have his first name right? You know, yeah. yeah. Look at what he's got in trouble for, you know, revealing. And uh, those guys are real whistleblowers. Uh, Snowden, definitely the real deal. Um, but uh, yeah, but he here's the thing. I admit, um, you know, when I express opinions and stuff, I like to say I could be wrong. I mean, you know, if Grush turns out to deliver and be the real thing, then hey, I was wrong and. My view is there's certain things that it would be cool to be wrong about, right? Yeah. Um, it'd be great if disclosure was really going to happen. I mean, I want to know as much as as anybody. So, that, you know, I, I like to admit I, I could be wrong about something. Yeah. I mean, hey, that's the way I am, too. I I, I always say, you know, I, I, listen, I'm, I'm not the smartest guy in the room. I never have been. I never will be. So when I say something, if I'm wrong, it shouldn't be a shocker. Like, you know, like I'm just the guy in the room that's not scared yeah. to say what I think out loud. You know, everybody else is like, oh, what if I'm wrong? I'm like, exactly. I expect yeah. that I'm wrong. So like, that's why I say what I want to say. So it's just like, whatever, you know? Uh, but listen, last time you were on the show, we did we did a lot of conversating. We, we even did an overtime and I'm drawing a blank as to what we actually talked about in the overtime. But um, I remember on the list of things I wanted to talk to you about last time was uh, uh, Disneyland. And your investigation into yeah. Disneyland, and it, it's it's accompanied by a book, and we just never got around to it. And I figured, why not do a whole episode on this? Because there's probably, if, hey, listen, if somebody writes a book about something, there's probably enough to fill a podcast episode about it. So, uh, sure. <laughs> but uh, the the book is called Latitude Thirty Three. Key to the Kingdom. Uh, before yes. we kind of start diving into it, just tell people where they can get it. And the link will be in the description of the episode as well. Um, I, I believe it's one of the books we've got up at uh, walterbosley.com. Um, I still print and distribute through lulu.com, L-U-L-U.com. So, you know, if, if, if there's something that's not quite up at walterbosley.com, you can get it at lulu.com. Perfect. Sounds good. Links will be in the description below because I really, really expect people to be interested in this book after they hear about it today. And let me elaborate. It's walterbosley.com slash shop. It'll take you right to the page where the books are. walterbosley.com slash shop. Awesome. walterbosley.com slash shop. Easy to remember. That's so I, I was reading in the description of this, this book, and literally in the uh -huh. second sentence is enough to captivate me. I'm just going to read the first two sentences. And it says, an investigation into arcane science and engineering at the world's most famous theme park. Here's the hit. Here is the punchline. Was there an interdimensional portal that influenced psychic perception of visitors and allowed beings to enter Across time and space. I'll, I Listen, like I told you before, all you have to do is whisper in my ear, portal, 
and we're doing an episode yeah. on it. Like, <laughs> and so uh, I, I'm, I've been really interested in this whole thing that you had talked, and I've heard you talk about it before. And so I wanted to definitely introduce this topic to the audience. Now, uh, sure. if you could, maybe let's just start off with how did this, this book even come to it ex in, into existence, like the idea of the book? <laughs> Well, that's an interesting story. Um, I'd like to say that, you know, just because I may roll my eyes and doubt certain claimants of extraordinary things, by no means does that mean I question extraordinary things because I've experienced them myself. Just as I think UFOs, some UFOs are from other worlds, and we certainly have been visited from those other planets and worlds, I also, um, I, I, I hate to use the word believe. I, I also think um, that all manner of strange phenomena and woo and stuff is, is very real because I, I've experienced it like millions of other people, you know, have. And this particular story is really interesting. Um, it was the first uh, nonfiction book that I wrote. I was a fiction writer and I wrote scripts. Uh, and, and I tried my hand at nonfiction because I felt really compelled to tell this story. And how it began, I was kind of um, an unofficial co-host for my friend Greg Bishop on his old show. Well, he still does it, I think, Radio Mysterioso. And uh, one night back in 2006, um, we were talking about... Um, stuff uh, about Disneyland and we pulled it up on on online and we saw that the latitude longitude um had it at 33 degrees north latitude and we knew that that was in that mystery zone around the planet right where there's all sorts of other interesting things and um we thought wow that's that that is kind of interesting and what had led to the conversation was I had had this weird experience uh, at Disneyland in 1981. And um, I'd gone there with some friends. Now, folks, back in the old days, 42 years ago, you could go to Disneyland, um, you know, like in February. And if you went on a Wednesday night, there was no crowd, you know, by um, by sundown all the families and the kids that, you know, it's the middle of a school week, it, you know, the place just wasn't crowded. It was a different experience. So we would go during the week and I was there with some high school friends and um, we were on the carousel, myself and a couple of friends. And as we went around, I noticed this old man, white hair, um, white beard. He was wearing a black suit, no tie, white shirt, but he was just standing there watching the carousel go round. And Something just, I just noticed him and, you know, would look at him every time I went around. And then finally, we went around one time and he wasn't there. And I thought, huh, that's kind of interesting. He just stood out to me. So we get off the carousel and we go walking back. For those who don't know the geography of Disneyland, when you go between um, uh, uh, the Dumbo ride and, and Mr. Toad's wild ride, you go back into the park where the uh, teacups are towards the Matterhorn. And there, at that time, there was a bench um, sitting like under the monorail track um, near the Matterhorn. And this old man was sitting there by himself. And I was, like I said, I was with two friends. I felt compelled to approach the man and um, asked him, you know, if he's having a good time. And uh, we got to chatting and he said that uh, he, he, he had, you know, never been here before to Disneyland. And um, he was down to, I think, like two tickets. This was around 930 in the evening. And uh you know, um, he, he wanted to go ride. It's a small world. So we went and rode small world with him and you, this guy, his eyes were just like everything. This was the most amazing place he had ever seen. And I had him, I placed him around like 70 years old and, and, uh, he, in our chatting, he told me his name was Alfred and uh, we go, we ride, it's a small world. And then after we get off, um, in those days, you could buy an optional ticket. You could get the ticket books, which is what he had with a limited number of, of tickets in it. And I had, my friends and I had the passport, the unlimited passport. 
So, you know, I'm a Southern California kid. I've grown up going to Disneyland. I go all the time. I decided to give this old man my unlimited passport ticket because there was still an hour and a half before the park closed and he could ride whatever he wanted as often as he wanted. So I pinned it with this Donald Duck pin onto his lapel. Okay. And I said, Hey, with this, you can go on whatever rides you wanted to go on that you didn't have tickets for as many times as you want. You would have thought I had given him a pot of gold. This guy was really grateful. He was yeah, just, oh my gosh, thank you, thank you. That that is so nice. And and off he went back into fantasy land and, you know, went in there till, you know, we couldn't couldn't see him. He just kind of disappeared into the the buildings and stuff like that. Not literally disappeared. Sometimes I say that and people don't get that it, it's figuratively. So um, you know, I I'm I'm a high school kid, high school senior, and we go off the rest of the night. My friends say, Oh, that was a nice thing you did, and you know, I felt all warm and fuzzy and but it was just, I, I went away and I never forgot the guy. And over the years, you know, um, I just never forgot this old man named Alfred, who I had this strange encounter with at Disneyland. Well, in 1992, 11 years later, I'm working for the FBI. I'm in Manhattan, I'm working on a counterintelligence squad and uh, at an undercover site um, that it's not a site anymore, but back in the Cold War, it was. And there was a, a bookstore within walking distance of where this site was that I worked. And those who are familiar with Manhattan, it was the Coliseum Bookstore. I don't know if it's still there, but it's up near Columbus Circle. And I would go there, you know, during my lunch times, a few days a week. And I'm in there in 1992, which this is significant. And I'm looking at the books on the kind of stuff we like, right? And I find this book, The Old Straight Straight Track. And it's about this these things called ley lines, which I was vaguely familiar with at the time because back in the 80s, some gentlemen had done a little research and analysis, and they had put together this um, hypothesis and this map that showed that at the intersections of what they were calling ley lines also, there were a lot of reports of UFOs and other paranormal activity, mostly at the intersections of these. And that's my familiarity with ley lines at that time. So here's this book written in uh, 1928, all about ley line research, um, early 20th century ley line research. And I'm looking at this thing and I'm like, oh, this is interesting. And I notice the author's name is Alfred Watkins. I go, huh, okay. So I turn the book over, or open it up or whatever. There's a photo of this guy. And I kid you not, I'm getting goosebumps now. I'm, it's silly, I know, but in the photo, was the man I met at Disneyland. I mean, it hit me. I was stunned. I'm like, wait a minute, that that's the Alfred I met at Disneyland. So I'm looking in there and I find out, wait, it couldn't have been because he died in 1935. And it, it was just unmistakable. I couldn't reconcile, okay, what the heck's going on here? You know, um, and then over the the years between then and 2006, you know, I studied and learned more and was learning more about time phenomena and getting even deeper into, you know, trying to understand time travel phenomena and such. And um, uh, I go into 2006, this conversation with uh, Greg Bishop on his show, and I tell this story. And, you know, we find that Disneyland is on the 33rd degree latitude and we're thinking, oh, I don't know, what's, what exactly is going on here? And, um, I decided, okay, I need to look into this. So I started looking into it in 2006 and I started finding things that, um, really blew me away and convinced me even more that that Alfred I met was, or had something to do with Alfred Watkins himself, um, you know, and just all sorts of synchronicities, not the least of which was, I mem remember I said the year 1992 would prove important. Well, what I found out was the man who engineered and designed physical Disneyland was a man named C.V. Wood, Cornelius Wood. And he died 
1992, the very year that I learn about this Alfred Watkins book. And that, my friends, is a synchronicity, um, <laughs> uh, as they happen in the practical world. And anyway, that with that, I, I, you know, I learned that C.V. Wood had worked for SRI, Stanford Research Institute, the think tank that's involved with all manner of weirdness. And then from there, I realized, wait a minute, I, this guy designed Disneyland? What the heck? And from there, I just dove in and had to pull all those threads. Um, and that's the beginning of how Latitude 33 came about. That's wild. So uh, C.V. Wood designing Disneyland uh, and being involved in SRI. Um, what what kind of things is C.V. Wood like? Like how, how what kind of things is he involved in that you maybe learned about from SRI that might lay over to Disneyland? You know, like it's not just a coincidence. Is what you're trying to say, right? Um, C.V. Wood, when you look into him, you find out he's a man who was very much interested and involved with um, psychic research. He was an associate, a friend of a guy named Peter Herkos, who in the late 50s and early 60s was a, a popular psychic, um, particularly with media folks. I believe Peter Herkos, H-U-R-K-O-S, even appears in the film The Boston Strangler. Um, I, I think he, he was involved with the investigation of that case, but, um, uh, Wood was also a founding member of what was called the mind sciences foundation with a guy named Tom Swift. Now, if you look up Tom Swift, you find out that he was a wealthy philanthropist who had a personal, uh, quest to find the Yeti, the abominable snowman. And, um, uh, Swift was also very much into psychic phenomena and he and wood um i don't recall if Herkos was but but wood and and um swift were two of the co-founders of the mind science foundation so so you have this guy cv wood who's into all this psychic um and consciousness phenomena and he's also an engineer and he's also working for this um you know w w soon to be legendary uh, firm, think tank firm, SRI, Stanford Research Institute. So in the early mid fifties, when the Disney brothers were really serious about building Disneyland and they wanted to pick just the right location, they went to SRI and SRI assigned CV Wood to help them do analysis of different um, potential sites and determine which would be the best. So CV Wood is the guy who found the Anaheim location, the, the present Anaheim location of Disneyland, and he really pushed that. Now, they did, the Disneys did select that site. Now, here's what's interesting about that. Consider what I just said he was into, all sorts of psychic and consciousness phenomena. Consider that he's an engineer, okay? And consider what's called telluric current, an extreme low frequency energy that runs through the earth. It, it's a real thing. You can Google it. Um, it's something that uh, the uh, railroads got involved with because the railroads owned the telegraphy companies, you know, the little Morse code telegrapher stations. And those guys learned that this natural energy running through the uh, terrain could augment the function of their telegraphy systems. Now, in subsequent decades, um, early 20th century, the early radio technicians also learned that telluric current um, could boost their signal and boost their function. And so a lot of radio towers are placed along where you can find telluric current. If you understand geomorphology and reading, you know, all the terrain and stuff, you can identify where these telluric currents are. In fact, I believe one of the major railroads put out a map. I think it was a railroad or an oil company uh, did a map of telluric currents that, you know, they help form the terrain when a planet is forming. And then once the surface solidifies, the telluric current just continues to flow along that terrain that it helped form in the volcanic era of that planet's formation. So um, this is the kind of thing that a guy like C.V. Wood would have been aware of, telluric current. Now, I had 
some geomorphological analysis done by a gentleman named Sesh Hari, who is an independent researcher who's spent, you know, almost a lifetime looking at these things. And, and he has a, you know, a skill where he's pretty good at, at reading the terrain and looking at topographical maps and considering all the elements. And he can identify, and he does this for me, he does these maps identifying where the Telluric current is. And he identified early in my research after I found out about C.V. Wood, he identified that there is an intersection of three major, uh, what he calls the curvy linear telluric current streams. They run through the property where Disneyland is at and they intersect at one point. And here's what's interesting. He found this intersection under the ground, right under where the carousel used to sit. So in 55, when they built Disneyland, okay, they built it in this spot where Seshari has identified this Telert current intersection. And, and he and I both argue that C.V. Wood certainly knew it was there. And that's probably why, in our opinion, he pushed for the Disney brothers to uh, build on the Anaheim site. Now, Disneyland, and I'll get into this a little later, but Disneyland's built into a bowl. And that has to do with the functionality of what I and Seshari think that um, C.V. Wood actually built for Disney. But um, when he told me that the intersection's under the carousel, where the carousel used to sit, that's where the carousel was sitting that night in 81 that I was writing it and encountered the mysterious gentleman, Alfred. Mm. Now, why is that significant? Because I think that Disneyland is a is a psychotronic device. The park was built to be a psychotronic device. The, the key functioning mechanism was the carousel. Why do I say was? It, because in 1983, 82, when they redesigned Fantasyland, they moved the carousel from its original position. I think they disengaged the device when they did that. But at the time, the carousel, if you put a rotating spinning object above a place where there's this telluric energy, the idea, the hypothesis now, okay, remember, this is a hypothesis, is that it draws the energy up from the place. Now, in this instance, it would be an intersection of three lines. So it's three times as powerful. So you put that rotating spinning device right over that intersection. You're drawing that energy up. And then because of the nature of it, it's a carousel. Okay. It's, it's kind of wide and flat. Not only does it draw it up, but then the spin disperses that energy around throughout the park. Now the park being built into a bowl. If you look at Disneyland, physical Disneyland is a bowl. Okay. When you walk in, you're at ground level. As you go into Disneyland, you may not know it, but you're gradually going lower and lower and lower, okay? And um, what, it, what that does, theoretically, is the carousel draws the energy up, it distributes it through the park, but because it's in a bowl, that energy goes to the rim of the bowl, the berm goes up and comes back down, so it self-contains. So that's the idea, is that the carousel is the part that makes it work spreads the energy, but the energy fills the park, but then stays in the park, bringing kind of new meaning to the, the most magical place on <laughs> earth, right? Yeah. The magic kingdom. Um, and what this does hypothetically, psychotronically is it, uh, lends to the experience of being there. Disneyland used to be not so much anymore, used to be the kind of place, you know, where you, you lose track of time. You forget that Anaheim, California is right outside the fence. You're, you literally are in this, this other world. And I argue that that's a byproduct of that energy that was being dispersed. Um, that's, that's what I think CV Wood engineered and designed. That's wild. For the Disney's. That, that's wild. Now, let me ask you, I mean, it begs the question, uh, how much did the Disney's know about this whole uh, functionality that we're theorizing about? I mean, they, they, they go to SRI, SRI uh, assigns C.V. Wood to the project. 
um, theoretically speaking, you're you're putting back then probably today would be billions back back then millions of dollars into yeah. this theme park. Uh, you you would want to as the person building it, you would want to know. Uh, all the different details. Why'd you choose this location? You know, all because the, there's there's symbology right. and all that stuff. So, um, did they know? Do you think that that this was a uh, this device was some kind of um, portal device? This carousel, a device? Yeah, I do not think so. And this is where some people out there get frustrated with me because in my research now remember i used to be a federal investigator mm -hmm. okay i know how to research things and how to investigate things okay um i found nothing about cv wood that linked him or associated him or characterized him as somebody who was into any kind of dark mind control okay he was the kind of man that i firmly am convinced that if I'm right, that if he did do this, he was truly doing it to enhance the experience of being in the park. It was, it, it, he was into these things, psychic phenomena. And I think it was, it was something that he wanted to try. Gee, you know, let's try this. But there was nothing sinister about the man or anything I, I could find um, that would have made this a, a creepy mind control thing. And then there's the issue of Walt Disney himself. Okay. I can't tell you how many times it doesn't matter. Some people, it doesn't matter. You tell them that you did a dive on this. You looked at it and you didn't find anything to back up the popular stuff that Walt Disney was some type of Masonic Templar hell bent on, on uh, controlling children in some evil way. It, it, that is ridiculous. And it's stupid, and it does not match the facts. Walt Disney was in D. Malay, which is a youth organization, yes, sponsored by Freemasonry. I, I never found any record. I even checked with uh, a couple of um, Masonic, um, wow, I can't think of the, the state level Masonic offices. Um, and, and, you know, for disclosure sake, I used to be a Mason. I, I made it to third degree oh, Mason, masonry in 1993 or 92. And I, I haven't been involved since then. Cause I went into the air force and I was going around the country, going around the world. And I just never got involved with a, a lodge again. So, you know, I, my point is I know how to ask a Masonic lodge. Okay, in the state level office, how to look up something, and and because of that, I was able to, you know, uh, uh, confirm as far as I could that Walt Disney was never a Mason. Now, I don't think Walt knew what C.V. Wood was doing with his park. The reason C.V. Wood got fired was because he started doing interviews in which he let people refer to him, and he referred to himself as the man who built Disneyland. And Walt didn't like that. <laughs> Considering because, Disneyland is in the name Walt Disney, you know, <laughs> yeah, there's got to be know, a little I mean, bit of an and, ego, right? Yes. And in all fairness to Walt Disney, he had his artists extensively design, you know, what he wanted in the park. So I think CV just let his enthusiasm and his ego get out of hand. So he he got fired by by Walt for that. Now, there is a guy, and I talk about this in the book, who was friends with Walt Disney. And that was Walter Knott, the founder of Knott's Berry Farm. With HelloFresh, it's always a delight. Farm fresh ingredients, both day and night. Pre-portioned with care, recipes so rare. Delivered to your door with time to spare. Skip the store, avoid the queue. HelloFresh makes cooking easy for you. Fun, affordable, a culinary treat. It's America's favorite meal kit to eat. New Year's resolution, a time to cheer. Save money, eat well, stress, disappear. HelloFresh is here, a helping hand. For a delicious year, oh so grand. Fresh ingredients, recipes with flair, affordable prices beyond compare. Delivered with joy, right to your door, Say hello to flavors you'll adore. As the year unfolds, healthy eating calls. HelloFresh 
answers with meals that enthrall. Calorie smart, protein smart, over 30 to choose. Wholesome, health forward, you just can't lose. Revamp your habits, give your diet a twist. With HelloFresh, healthy eating can't be amiss. A year of flavors, a journey so fresh. Celebrate each meal with HelloFresh. Go to HelloFresh.com slash confessionals free and use code confessionals free for free breakfast for life. One breakfast item per box while subscription is active. That's free breakfast for life at HelloFresh.com slash confessionals free with code confessionals free. Walter Knott was into this spooky stuff, scary stories, the paranormal. Walter Knott... um, uh, he built Calico Ghost Town, which is out here in California, and it, it's owned, it's affiliated with Knott's Berry Farm still, and it's a uh, state park as well. But what a lot of people don't know, I didn't know until I wrote the book, but the buildings, most of the old buildings at Calico Ghost Town were not the ones in Calico's silver mining Old West days. No, Walter Knott bought the standing buildings, except the Birdcage Theater. He bought most of the standing buildings in tombstone that were there back when he was building calico ghost town but had been there during the famous gunfight at the ok corral Hmm. and he had them disassembled and numbered and then reassembled at calico ghost town for his old west town and calico ghost town so think of the ghosts that came with those buildings and um there are stories of paranormal uh things going on at old calico ghost town um, but Walter Knott was really into this and he and Disney were pretty good friends. They got along real well and hung out and I think played polo together, I think. And, um, but I never found anything where Walt was anything other than, you know, Walt liked to have some scotch. He liked to smoke. He was a chain smoking scotch drinking, uh, it, and he, he talked like a sailor sometimes. You know, he used to, he used naughty language at times, got salty, but, but Walt was not these evil conspiratorial things that people will still, they'll look at me, they'll listen and they'll go, okay, Uh, well, back to Walt Disney being an evil, sinister (laughs) wizard. I'm like, okay, you're just doing that now because it gets, you know, clicks and, and ratings and stuff. But, um, uh, and, and I thought it was important to look at that because my gosh, if I was finding evidence of something like this going on at Disneyland, it meant, you know, I had to ask, well, shoot, are the, are the sinister Walt stories true? And I, I swear I found that it was not true that, that really anything mystical going on with Disneyland was engineered by this CV Wood gentleman. Interesting. Very interesting. Uh, have you ever come across any of information with, when it concerns Walt Disney on whether he actually froze his body or something like that for being able to come back another time in the future? Is that Have you heard anything about that? Um, uh, everybody's heard of that story over the years. Um, you know, I guess we'll just have to see. But if you go to um, uh, Forest Lawn Cemetery out in Glendale, I think. Um, there's a gravesite right there, Walt Disney, and his wife is there. So, you know, you have to decide for yourself if if he's really in that grave or yeah. if he's, you know, in a jar under Space Mountain. That's the version I heard. <laughs> <laughs> well, you never know. All right. So back to the park. Um, C.V. Yeah. Wood creates this park. Uh, he puts the carousel at this one place where, you know, it's a spinning object. It's circulating this energy out throughout the park and kind of revolving it back in, almost like the infinity symbol. And uh, did, did so C.V. Wood, uh, you think, is pretty non-nefarious in this whole thing, right? Yeah, I, I don't, I never found anything that made him any kind of sinister left-hand path, uh, mind control kind of guy okay uh he he left sri by the way to go work for the disneys he loved it the project so much that he resigned from sri and he never worked for them again so this would have been 1954 okay so 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 you're saying he left his job to work for the disneys and the disneys fired him because he said that he built (laughs) that's crazy now he was also the designer of uh, other amusement parks. The the only other one besides Disneyland that has turned out successful 
uh, is uh, it's the original Six Flags Park outside of um, Dallas, Fort Worth, I think. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so th- this carousel um, and your interaction with Alfred Watkins uh, is... Is there is there a possibility that I mean, with, given what you know about Alfred, I think you said he died in the thirties, nineteen thirty five, nineteen thirty five. That's the year my grandfather was born, uh, and he writes this book. You see him in eighty two, I believe you said right, eighty one, eighty one, eighty one in the park. Like, is there a chance that? And he's staring at the carousel. You're on the carousel, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, like, is there is there is there a chance in in, in your understanding, uh, your thoughts on the idea of this carousel opening a portal where literally people from other times and realms could transcend? Yeah. I mean, are we talking like that's a possibility here in your mind? Uh, I am. I'm talking like it is. I talk about that in the book. In fact, I offer, I believe, four possibilities um, to explain Alfred. Number one. It's all just a coincidence. He's just an old guy who happens to look just like this Alfred Watkins guy. And it was all just a coincidence, number one. Number two, that um, it was a tulpa, you know, the, the being that's created from, you know, human focus and concentration. The problem with that is I had never heard of Alfred Watkins back then. So it couldn't have been a tulpa that I generated. Um, Then there is the idea of a very interesting group of people that um, have shown up one way or another. This boggles my mind still. They have shown up one way or another in every single one of my nonfiction lines of research that I've written books about. Even things that I think, well, th- they would have nothing to do with this. Sure enough, something to do with them shows up. Who are they? Well, they're called the Tuatha Dé Danann. And uh, they're traditionally associated with what we call the fairy lore, the fairy um, world. They're interdimensionals. Okay. Now, here's what's interesting is, remember I told you when I gave him my ticket, he was incredibly, exceedingly thankful. Well, I learned after that, you know, when I, over the years, um, and oh, and I would, I had never heard of the Tuatha Dé Danann until the late eighties in, um, a Jacques Vallée book on UFOs, but in 1981, I'd never heard of them. Well, one of the things that the fairy world, the interdimensionals do, um, is, is if you're generous they're very grateful. They love when human beings are generous and give them, bestow upon them a gift. And I, I interpret my just giving him my my passport ticket as, you know, um, I had, uh, un, unbeknownst to me, this is in the interdimensional possibility, he was, he, he was an interdimensional making himself appear as this Alfred Watkins guy. Um, and I'll get to more on that in a moment. But because I had simply given him the ticket, I had sacrificed my passport ticket, given it to him. That was some type of um, uh, landmark test of character that I pass with this interdimensional, possibly to it, Adida Nan being. And, and so what they do is they then give you a blessing. Why would he appear as somebody I didn't know about, right? I didn't know anything in 1981 about ley lines. I didn't know anything about um, Alfred Watkins. But why would he appear as Alfred Watkins? Because, as Alan Bates' character says in Mothman Prophecies, these beings, from their perspective, they can see just a little farther down the road. And my thinking oh, gives me goosebumps again. Sorry, I. It's a reaction I have when talking about certain things. Um, I think the reason that it would have this interdimensional in if it's an interdimensional, if it was an interdimensional attuity to Nan, I think the reason it, it appeared as Alfred Watkins was because it knew eleven years later that I would see that book 
and I would recognize Alfred. So in that particular possibility, I was encountering directly the Tua de Didanan, and they have made themselves they have made themselves their presence known to me in subsequent years from time to time at different instances. Um, they've let me know they're out there. Uh, even when I think, okay, it's gone, it's past, they've forgotten about it. No, there they are. And, um, uh, they knew, they knew that I would, um, you know, see him and recognize this for, and, and then want to want to pull threads. So that's, that's the third possibility. As I said, there was just coincidence. Um, and, uh, there's Tulpa, which couldn't have been a Tulpa that I generated. And then there's two at a Nan. Now the fourth possibility, these are the possibilities I talk about in the book. The fourth is the literal one. And, and I, I, I love the idea of interacting with the two at a Nan. I truly do. But I also love the idea that it was just a portal and it was the real Alfred Watkins. And here's why I add that possibility. Remember, I told you this man was looking around like this was the most amazing place he had ever seen. Like he was stunned, almost like back in 1927 when he was doing the research for his 1928 book. Maybe, maybe there he was walking along the the ley lines. Oh man! And he stepped forty-five. Uh, you know, or it was more than because he died forty-five years before I saw him. But you get my idea. Decades. He stepped decades ahead in time and space. Found himself in Disneyland, wondering what the hell is this place? You know, and here's this knucklehead who just keys in on him, and and you know, who is this guy? And, you know, so that in the book, I talk about that being my personal favorite yeah, possibility, but absolutely. that was at the time I wrote the book. Since then, I, I have elevated that um, equally favorite is an encounter with the two at Nan because they, um, once you encounter them, they don't go, not, not completely. They, you, you, you see them again, uh, so to speak. <laughs> That's and, interesting. Um, they certainly have continually popped up in my path you know, of research and in my life. So um, those are the four possibilities to explain Alfred. And um, well, listen, uh, as much as I like the two Adidas and Anne, okay, let, let's pause for a second and just really yeah. take in the fact that I said that on the first try. That was actually quite impressive by me. <laughs> Good job, me. Uh, but as much as I, I like the idea, uh, yeah, Alfred showing up in 1981, that's my favorite personally. Okay, we were talking about theories and who's uh, like, I, I don't care about the Tulpa idea, the coincidence not happening. I like the idea that Alfred, now do we know, was Alfred uh, in the California area? Do you know that at all? Not that I ever found. I, I I never found where he had ever come to California. So do you think that it's possible, theoretically speaking, that if somebody is at one of these intersecting points on these ley lines, uh, let's just say, uh, it w would, would Stonehenge be one of those intersecting points? Uh, honestly, I have not. Uh, my guy has not done an analysis of Stonehenge. Um, but I, you know, it's, it's a good question. Okay. Um, he, he should, you know, and I can let you know another time down Sounds the good. road, but, um, but I get where you're going. The idea is where there are other intersections can such extraordinary things happen. And I think so. I think that's what those guys who noticed that where there's these intersections of this energy, there are more reports of UFOs. Bigfoot ghosts, you know, paranormal activity. So there's something going on where these intersections are and portals certainly would, could be one of them. Yeah, no, I, I, I 100% love that theory. Uh, so if this is a portal and, uh, I mean, I'm assuming that you, you've at least theoretically thought about, if not looked into these ideas, uh, do you, oh, yeah. do you, I mean, outside of Disneyland and, and the carousel, uh, and even, you know, the ley lines, uh, do you, 
have you come across, have you looked into, maybe found other evidences that that we that that man can generate and uh, uh, create physical devices that can then generate portals? I mean, is that something that you think is very much w- well within the range outside of the carousel, Disneyland, and the ley lines? I, I think so. Um, I, I think that, see, I am long overdue on a follow-up um, to the Latitude 33 book, because here's what I think is going on, and, and I think this serves to answer your question, part of it anyway. I think that C.V. Wood got this idea from uh, a previous uh, from from previous knowledge of, of of a secret tradition, um, and I don't want to make that sound so big and and ominous, but I think there was a group of of people at the turn of the century, nineteenth into the twentieth, who were doing this with carousels because subsequent research we have found other old carousels located on these intersections or even on just one line wow. going through, but we have found carousels located on this energy, old carousels. And so I think that C.V. Wood learned about this from, you know, some other source that was aware of somebody doing this. And that's what my follow-up book, I've wanted it to be about for years, is um, to try to find out who it is. And I've been on that trail, and they've really, really (laughs) covered their tracks deeply but uh, yeah, that and I ended up writing, by the way, a time travel novel in which the character uses the carousels to go through time and space. And what's interesting is this novel and its publication predates the movie Now You See Us or whatever about the magicians yeah. where it ends with the carousel and they jump interdimensionally. Someone saw that movie and they said, hey, Walter, I think they read your book. And uh, I watched it. I'm like, oh, yeah, okay, that's that's pretty accurate to how it would be. And the reason I wrote that is because I do think I put I tell people all the time, don't ignore the fiction written by nonfiction researchers, because there are ideas that we can't rightfully put in our nonfiction that we still want to get down and we want to explore, but we want to get down on paper. We want to explore it. We want the concept out there. So I put those kinds of things um, in my fiction and this novel in particular, um, you know, has the, um, uh, the result of my experience with this Disneyland thing and with researching it and writing it and what I think is going on. It's dramatized, of course, but, um, yeah, I think this is something that um, there's somebody out there that know that has known about this, and they've been they've, they've been putting these carousels like a network, you know. Um, and one idea is the idea that if you know how to do it, you can get on these carousels and go from one place to another interdimensionally, time and space we're talking. And what's interesting is, uh, tomorrow, uh, well, uh, this is recorded for later, but I'm going to be doing an upcoming episode on my show where we talk about trans temporal cosmic phenomena. And we're going to be, um, talking about this human factor. What is it that a human being can do to be part of this mechanism that, you know, makes us, makes it functional. And that's really what we're talking about here is what did C.V. Wood understand about the human mind? What did he, um, you know, in my opinion, Disneyland was engineered uh, with the human consciousness as the key Mm. that makes it go or, or, or the, and maybe if I'm getting that wrong, but you, you get the idea that, that you plug in the human consciousness factor and that's when the magic starts. So uh, to answer your question, I think there is something, and I've gotten this out of diving into time travel studies. um, There is something specifically uh, powerful about the human will, okay, and the desire um, to do this plays uh, an, an operative 
function in going across time, going across time and space. In other words, the um, the the if you have some emotional hook, right, at your destination, like you in the film Somewhere in Time, it's because he falls in love with an actress who lived a hundred years before. So this romantic love is his anchor point to the past. So that's that's the the thing that he's connected to emotionally. So when you combine the emotion with the desire and the mind power, you are able to pull yourself through time and space. And I think that's the human factor. Um, so, uh, you know, um, uh, how did he do it? He surrounded himself with the trappings of the past, the target time and place. Okay. Um, that's the mechanism. Jack Finney writes about this in, in his novel, um, Time and Again, where the time traveler just surrounds himself with, you know, a place, the furnishings, the clothing, the music, the sounds, so that his mind locks into that target time and his will is able to do the rest. So there's something about this technology I think I'm finding and seeing that uh, requires, you know, the human consciousness to be that final little piece um, to plug in. If any of that made sense. No, it, it <laughs> may, totally makes sense. And I'm finding that with the people that I talk to about these types of things, there's a common thread of the mind uh, that is, is, a, is a piece of this puzzle that, that I think traditionally has been overlooked. Like we have traditionally thought, and maybe through you know, science fiction and things, like let's just create a device that you sit in, hit the power button, it generates up and it takes us away. Uh, mm -hmm. but, but there, there's a real aspect to the mind that I've even started, uh, not, I don't, I, I don't want to say I coined the phrase, but, uh, um, there's an author that heard me say it and said he wants to write a book with me based off this phrase, this idea of mind portals, you like the mind is a portal itself. And I don't know how to, yes. um, totally convey it into words, but uh, like you said, that the brain is the key, uh, and it's it's almost in that terminology, it's like the technology, the carousel, the know-how is the doorway, but the brain and the will is the key to open that doorway. Yeah, the key to the kingdom is the individual person going to the park. Each one of us, you know, back when it was engaged before they moved the carousel, each individual going to the park adult or child brought their consciousness and that was the key to turn on to really turn on the machine you know and and engage it that's the word i was looking for you know you engage um the 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 human consciousness and will in there and and yeah do you think that they moved the uh, carousel on purpose they wanted to shut that whole thing down i think it was out of i i i would think that I'm convinced that there's somebody in the Disney organization that knew and understood what CV Wood did, but I don't think that by the time you got to the 1980s, I don't think the people, because they were redesigning, revamping Fantasyland, and I don't think they, no, I don't think they realized what they were doing. They just needed the carousel moved back for the architecture of the new stuff, and that's what happened, and, and they disengaged it. But uh, I had a thought that I want to go back to so I don't forget it. Um, on what you were just saying, um, the mind being a portal, the question that comes up is, well, shoot, how come people aren't constantly doing this? And well, I, I the one answer to that is, you know, we know that there's people out there that know about this stuff and we know that there's suppression that goes on. Well, when you're talking about the power of the mind, one of the, 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 the strongest ways to lock that down and block it is to just condition people to think, oh, that's not real. Oh, you can't do those kinds of things. Oh, that's childish. Oh, that's not. so. What you do is you attack the um, the belief. You attack the um, uh, the 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 human um, capacity for um, you know thinking. Hey, could I do this? Should I try it? 
You know, if, if you want to keep people suppressed from doing this, you just tell them they can't and you condition them and it works. I mean, look how many people, um, laugh at these ideas, you know, when we're talking about them because they've been conditioned that it's, that's all nonsense. And it doesn't help that in our community ever since, you know, this community has been a thing for decades and a century or whatever. There's always been liars and fakers and goofballs who are telling BS stories you know, it doesn't help um, when you're trying to have a serious conversation about this, that um, it's it's got so much going against it. Well, that serves the function of suppressing these kinds of abilities and these ideas. You know, uh on that note, it make gives me a lot of hope. Not just not not for portal talk, for instance. Because I, I don't want my son going to another realm. But uh, my son really? is uh, I, maybe I want to go first, make sure it's safe. You know, like well, how old is he? <laughs> he's how old is he, he just turned six last week. So. Yeah, yeah. You want him around a little bit longer. Yeah, but, yeah, he, you hasn't, know. he hasn't ticked once me he off. gets to a certain age, though. Right. He <laughs> hasn't he hasn't ticked me off too much yet. Like he hasn't done anything yeah. too bad that I want to ship him off to the other <laughs> realm for a while. Uh, mm. But the, the the idea of uh, belief and and it, it, and it's like you were saying how you know we've been told that it's not real, it's not possible, and that diminishes the will to even try, and even to the point where like maybe you want to try and you want to believe, but your belief is just not there to let the will go a certain distance. Um, I have a lot of high hope because we're at the very beginning stages with all this technology that we're like what I'm doing right now for a living. I mean, it wasn't possible 20 years ago. Uh, and yeah. so this, this new era of kids being raised in this, this world of technology that information is being passed around so rapidly that there will be people in 20 years from now who were raised with, you know, insights like what you're talking about today that allows them to have a, a a starting line that's well beyond our starting line, you know, of belief. Mm -hmm. And uh, I I'm, I have hopes that you know as time goes on, these kind of ideas uh, are fleshed out more and understood more uh, and can be talked intelligently uh, without being you know the whole snicker factor. Uh, I I don't I don't I don't like the fact that. Uh, a lot, even in my own personal life, it just happened this past weekend. I, I had, um, uh, my son's birthday party and nobody snickered at me, but, uh, you know, I I'm hosting a party at my house and my son has friends from school coming over. So along with friends that are six years old coming over are the parents. And so we're all sitting there talking and they ask the inevitable question, what do you do for a living? And I say, oh, I, I run a media company. We do films and podcasts and things like that. And then the next question, if they're actually interested, is, oh, what about? And that's when it's like, all right, well, we're going to see yep. uh, who's who. Who's the real ones here? You know? <laughs> yep. Here's the real test coming yeah, up. <laughs> yeah. And so I'm hoping that, you know, in the future, uh, the future generations won't have to go through those mental hurdles, which means just the starting point is just so far beyond what we are dealing with today, where we're just trying to get people into the room to have the discussion. In the future, maybe the discussion won't even be have to be had of introduction. It's just like, yeah, that's real. So let's move past that real quick, uh, if that makes any sense. As the clock struck midnight on New Year's Eve, the quaint town of Oak Ridge was blanketed in a surreal calm. Tony, a local resident, had always found solace in the seclusion of his home, nestled on the outskirts of town. This year, however, the serenity of the new year was shattered by an unexpected terror. Tony, an advocate of the award-winning Simply Safe system, had chosen it for its affordability and comprehensive protection. It was a decision that would soon be put to the ultimate test. As the celebrations of 2023 faded into the stillness of the night, a chilling presence lurked outside his home. A monstrous figure towered and shrouded in mystery prowled the snowy landscape. It was Bigfoot, a creature of legend, emerging from the depths of the forest on this eerie New Year's Eve. Tony, jolted awake by this disturbance, watched in horror as the beast attempted to breach his sanctuary. 
the advanced sensors of his Simply Safe sprang into action, detecting the intrusion. The 24-7 lifeguard protection, a feature Tony had admired for its real-time crime-stopping ability, was now his lifeline. Monitoring agents, witnessing the surreal scene, spoke directly to the Bigfoot, their voices echoing through the speakers. The police are on the way. They're coming to get you, Bigfoot. The sheer size of Bigfoot made it a formidable opponent, but simply saves relentless alerts and the response of local authorities created a barrier too robust for the creature. Tony, huddled inside, realized the true value of his home security system. It wasn't just about the affordability or the ease of use. It was about the peace of mind it offered in the most unforeseen circumstances. As the sun rose on the first day of the new year, Tony's home stood unscathed, a testament to the efficacy of Simply Safe. The incident with Bigfoot became a tale of legend in Oak Ridge, and Tony's trust in his home security deepened. He understood that in a world of uncertainties, Simply Safe was a constant protector, guarding not just against common threats, but against the unimaginable horrors that lurk in the night. Keep your home and family safer than ever in the new year. As a listener, you can save 20% on your new system with a fast protect plan by visiting simplysafe.com slash confessionals. Customize your system in just minutes at simplysafe.com slash confessionals. There's no safe like Simply Safe. Oh, it makes perfect sense. It's long been the vision, the dream that um, I don't think it's ever going to happen that way. I, I don't think it's ever really been that way. You know, most people are busy with the day-to-day -day mm. mundane existence, and that's not an indictment of it. Um, it's just the way of things. It's it's human nature. Um, I do, I'm very egalitarian. I think every single human being is capable of these things, but it's whether they want to or not. It's whether they believe they can or not. It's how they've been conditioned. And um, I think that there are, I, I'm not here. It doesn't matter to me if anyone believes me on this. Personally, I'm convinced these two a dee nan, whoever, whatever they are, these interdimensionals, there, there's another intelligence that shares this world with us. They've been with us all along. And, you know, they're the ones who they pay attention and take note of those of us when we, any of us reaches a threshold where we kind of see a little bit more than the rest, where we maybe we see them, so to speak, and they know that we see them and uh, they don't let you forget it. And uh, it, it's kind of a, you know, a, it, it would be a rite of passage, but I, I really do think that it's just going to continue um, those who figure it out and those who figure out what they can do they'll they'll do those things they'll know those things and uh, they will for better or worse and there's an argument for better they will selectively share what they know now you know folks uh, I, I i'm sure you have an international audience you know we happen to live here in america sure. and i'm telling you any given moment you know i go out there drive down the street go to my grocery store i encounter you know 50 idiots who, I mean, it were probably better off them not being aware of what they could really do with their minds because they're <laughs> morons, they're jackasses, you know, and they would think of the things they would do. I mean, just look at social media, look at the things people do with that, <laughs> you know, Fair point. and that's, and, and then think of these same people with, Oh, you mean I can. I can like open a portal and go to other dimensions, dude, you know, it's, <laughs> let's take the party over there. And you're like, Oh, for God's sake. So look, you may not, we may not want a world where everybody knows and everybody can do it because it's not always going to have that maturing effect. What you just everyone, described you know? is Bill and Ted's excellent adventures. <laughs> That's exactly what you just described. And you're right. I don't want them traversing realms. <laughs> yeah, I don't want some guy in a bro dozer, you know, charging through a portal, you know, uh, and it, yeah. it, it just, it, you know, 
And, um, and don't get me wrong. My girlfriend has a big Tacoma pickup with big wheels and a big old deer ramming. You know, we have kind of a nice version of a bro dozer, you know, <laughs> that I ride around in with her. But, you know, you get the point. Um, we, and, and I think that's what one of the things if these if I mean, I'm convinced about these others that are with us. I think uh, that's part of their role is to kind of I don't want to use the police word, but um, regulate um how these things are used and um you know how people how far people develop with these things um develop these things and what they do with them so uh i i i think that that's the way of things and that's the way it will continue so you said that uh Latitude 33 was the first nonfiction book you wrote. Have you written any other mm-hmm. nonfictions? <laughs> yeah, that's mostly what I'm known for. That's what for. you're doing. Um, okay, gotcha. So so let me ask you, uh, have you ever done uh, a book on the Tua de Danan? Well, that's what I'm saying is the Tua de Danan have turned up in my research for all of the nonfiction books I've written so far, and that's like 13 or 14. It's really weird. You know, I go to write a book about Sir Richard Francis Burton and his mysterious um, expedition in South America. And evidence of the Tua de Didanan, you know, show up in that research. Same thing with, I write about Juan Cabrillo, okay, the Portuguese explore working for Spain in the 16th century and the two of the Dan turn up in that research. Same with Ambrose Bierce. I write a book about, you know, my dad's claims to have, you know, relative to the Roswell information and his weird story that happened to him in the fifties in the air force and the two of the Dan turn up in that they have turned up. They and the goddess Hecate are the two threads that have turned up in all my nonfiction whether it's about breakaway civilizations, airship mystery, or occult murder in San Bernardino, which is what my Empire of the Will trilogy is, um, there's Hecate and there's the Tua de Dida Nan. No matter what thread I pull, I could, I guarantee you, I could go write a book about football. Okay. Uh, I prefer baseball, but baseball we know is a mystical sport. So we wouldn't be surprised when it shows up there. But I could write about football or ping pong. And I guarantee you somewhere in the research, the Tua de Didanan will pop up or Hecate. Um, and, and it's weird. And, and now that's just where they pop up in my research. We could do a whole show about the personal phenomenon, phenomena that I've encountered connected to the Tua de Didanan and the goddess Hecate. So there's something going on with them in our world um, that's very substantial. Maybe we need to bring you back for another third uh, installment then to talk about that. I'll talk about it uh, if they don't throw vegetables and boo and hiss at Ah, me because... (laughs) It's bound to happen at some point, okay? So... uh, Of course. And and it's just, it's a rite of passage uh, when when you do these kind of things, if you're going if you're gonna come out with something that's of any substance and worth listening to or reading, you you're going to have people who just that's true do not like it and Absolutely. want to shout you down, and that's okay. Well, that's why I say it, I I've crossed a line where certain things it doesn't matter to me if someone believes me or not. I know what I saw, I know what I experienced, you know. Right. Yeah. So let me ask you this as well, because I have this down and I, I want to ask you this because I think more importantly, I think other people want to know this as well. Uh, in your understanding, when it comes to these, these spots, these intersectional spots, do you, uh, where the carousel used to be, other locations that are similar to that, do you think that it's possible for people to um, replicate what happened at Disneyland in other locations. So like, oh, yeah. cause I mean, it, what's interesting I, is that the, the carousel, you, you traditionally think about portals opening up and that you got to spin real fast. The carousel doesn't go that fast. So it, it, doesn't, no, it doesn't require an, an immense amount of energy, I would say. Right. Right. 
Right. It, um, and, and carousels have a flywheel aspect to them. And, you know, the flywheel we find in uh, Victor Schauberger and stuff, you know, from the 1920s. Now, I want to clarify something. Disneyland, what C.V. Wood did with Disneyland and the carousel, that in itself, in my opinion, is the replication of something that was done with carousels and Alert Current before. Mm. And, and, I, and, and Wood became aware of that, and he replicated it in his own way on a grander scale. With Disneyland in 1955. So Disneyland is one of the replications that you're talking about, I wow. think. Wow. Uh, and Alfred Watkins came through time and space. I'm convinced of it. So uh, it, it's got to work. It's got to work. Uh, I, I just, something's got to work. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I just, I'm fat. I don't, I don't know if a carousel, it, it was the impetus for how he did it. I think he just slipped through somehow. Um, you know, unless we find that he had some type of rotating device with him. I, I, it, just what you were saying earlier about the mind being the key and the will uh, in the book that he wrote, mm -hmm. clearly there, there was a go. mind and will for it. And if he was at one of these spots when he was minding and willing these things, who knows what could have happened? Exactly. Oh, and to clarify, because I know people are going to know this when they look it up, there is a difference. If you will see in my books, I originally referred to this energy in these lines as ley lines. And then the more I learned, the more I realized, now, wait a minute, there is a difference between telluric current and the term ley line. Now, the ley line is a straight line path traditionally that's between um, either past uh, former sacred locations or where um, uh, temple type structures have been built. Okay. And, uh, but the argument is, is that where these paths were made, these ley lines, there is telluric current flowing through them. So what they are were, were, markers of paths where somebody knew this energy was passing from one sacred site to another. So the, the telluric current is there, even though the technical term for what I'm writing about and what's going on at Disneyland, I try to, to be specific and say telluric current, but it's popular to call that ley lines. So we find ourselves doing that. Okay. Yeah, it's interesting you're talking about this because my point is my point is is that there was certainly telluric current running through the ley lines that Alfred Watkins was investigating, in my opinion. Yeah. So I mean, it 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 seems like there needs to be a combination of both for the for the perfect storm, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh I, I find Well, this there's gotta at least be the telluric current, yeah. Right. Uh the the key is the telluric current. Uh I, I I find this interesting because there's a guy who uh, used to work around very high ranking uh, officials in our government, and he was basically a fly mm -hmm. on the wall with what his job was. But he was he he heard very interesting conversations, and um, and he wants to come talk to me in my studio about these similar things, ley lines and different stuff. And I'm interested because by the time he comes to me in my studio to record with me, this episode probably should be, had have, have been released by then. So he'll have heard that. And uh, I'm interested to hear if it's, if it's matching up with what he's talking about. Cause some of the things you're saying, he, cause this guy, he, he drove, uh, to another state just to meet me in a line at an event I was doing to to talk to me and say, listen, this is who I am. I need to talk to you about this stuff. I'm just like, bro, like, interesting. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, he, it, it's oh. just, I'm, I'm like, I'm hooked. You know, so, <laughs> I'm, I, yeah. I'm firmly well, convinced. You know, I just, go ahead. Oh, no, no, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was just, just going to say, I'm firmly convinced that whatever he comes to talk to me about, most of it's going to go over my head. So I'm going to do the best I can to host a conversation. So all the other listeners that are smarter than me can catch the drift and really run with the information. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I'm telling you, when Seshari gets talking about this stuff, um, uh, it, some of it goes over my head, particularly when my friend Joseph Farrell and I are talking about it. But I, I realized I had a couple of the Seshari maps and I thought I'd show them. Please, if you want to see one, this is a Telurk current map that he identified the Telurk currents in the Lake Tahoe area. So I don't know if you can see those 
yeah the the lines that he did very well there but those are the lines he did and he identified that to alert current and an intersection there in lake tahoe um that's an example and there i have you know over the years he's been giving me um these analyses of the different places that i've researched you know as it comes up but anyway i just i i just saw those on the desk and i wanted to share them has he done any for tennessee that's where i'm located uh well yeah what he's done is years ago he gave me a large uh map of the united states where he's done the analysis across the continental u.s and um that's getting old and wrinkly i'm gonna have to either get him to do a fresh one or i'm gonna have to i've taken digital pictures of it so that i don't lose it lose the data but yeah there's um i would have to be looking at the map to tell you exactly um, where the stuff is in Tennessee, but I have discussed with others who live in Tennessee, you know, the weird phenomena that they could tell me associated with those locations. But, um, generally when you're talking about a place that's known for UFOs, paranormal activity, what have you, you know, big, whatever, strange phenomena, you can go to this map and you can see that this current runs through there. That's, Um, that's where I live. Another thing that's interesting. (laughs) Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly you know, where you I look live. at this, and you're like, "Wow." Um, so um, uh, he gave me this map of the U.S. that I'm describing uh, back in 2008 or 2009. I think it was nine, and um, it wasn't until years later that I happened to see the David Polites, um the map he does of the. Uh, What's the, how to say, the, the, the missing 411? Yeah, the missing 411, um, but the clusters, his cluster mm, map. Yeah. Now, he did this map after, okay, he published this map after I'd had this one from Sesheri for years. And it's, uh, it's a virtual match. Um, so, uh, yeah, so where his clusters are, are where Sesheri has identified intersections. Of the Tuller current. Now, here's another interesting thing. Someone else has done a layover of all the subterranean cavern systems in the U.S., and it's a match, too. Get out of town. Which doesn't surprise Seshery at all. So there's something going on with the caves and the caverns. There's something going on underground with this Tuller current and with these mysterious disappearances. Okay. And I don't think it's Bigfoot. <laughs> Oh my gosh, this is fascinating. Uh, so everything that you're talking about and describing literally is in this area that I live in. And even even David okay. has covered cases here in the Smoky Mountains in this area that I live in. Uh, yep. And next Friday, I'm spending an entire night in the mountains because uh, we've been given a location to where there's underground tunnel systems that we want to explore. Uh, it's about as far as oh, I can go, great. as far as, uh, detailing as what we're doing, but, uh, we're looking for very secluded secret cave tunnel systems that, uh, supposedly have a lot of weird, mysterious things happening around them. And so shoot, if I don't show up for the podcast, you know what happened? <laughs> the, the, well, the I think you me. need me to, I think you need me before you go on that. I will send you his entire of that of Tennessee, I would love so it so that you're armed with where the ley lines are because it could it, it could help you find something you're looking for too. Or if you go somewhere and there's something weird about it, or you have a weird experience, you look on that map and you see the the current. You know, it'll make a believer out of you. Oh, I, I'm, I'm telling you, it really will. I, can you not tell I'm already a believer? Please send it over. <laughs> yeah, but. <laughs> Okay, like UFOs. I've I've always accepted UFOs. You know, I they fascinated me when I was younger and stuff. I didn't really have my UFO experience until 2014. I mean, I've been into UFOs f- from the time I can remember when I was a little kid in the you know in the late 60s when my dad showed us the old magazines of Look and Life and all that. But I never saw a bona, bona fide UFO until December of 2014. Um, nine years ago. And let me tell you, if I, it's a different, it's a different level of belief before is an acceptance. I accept that that's real. Then when you experience it yourself, 
you're like, oh boy, okay, this is real. I, I mean, holy crap. You know, when you hear, if you were to hear the, I mute the video because <laughs> I'm like, holy, what the hell? <laughs> what is that? You know? And, um, yeah, so it, it, it's when you actually encounter the stuff, it's like crossing a Rubicon. You cross your own personal Rubicon where you really, after seeing that UFO, I don't give a rat's backside, a rat's ass about who doesn't believe I had the UFO experience because you know what? All that matters is I had it. I remember it. I, there was a witness standing there right with me who also saw it and other things. So there's certain things that, you just like it, it, it really doesn't matter if other people believe you or not, because guess what? It wasn't their experience. It was your experience. Any one of us can see a UFO. Any one of us can see a ghost. Any one of us can have the weird, um, you know, mind phenomena and stuff. But, but here's the interesting thing about all of this. Any one of us can experience this and many have, but for each person, it's oddly personal. Yeah. It's oddly personal, and that's the best way I can describe it now. And it doesn't, and that, and I don't mean that in a way that it makes it less real. Um, I kind of laugh at the naysayers and the people that haven't experienced something that, well, I won't believe it till I experience it. it you know, it's like, well, you're right. You're right. You won't believe it until you experience it. And I'd love to be a fly on the wall when you have your, your uh, wake up call moment but uh, and maybe that'll never happen uh, maybe not but it's funny that some of these people who are that, those kind of people i won't believe it till i see kind of thing are the same people who traditionally have rested back on the idea that you know the the official narrative and the government says that these things don't exist and now the government's like oh these things exist and they're like oh what's my excuse now what do i fall back on now you know i i even uh before years ago before i quit driving truck uh that when back in 2017 when all this disclosure stuff first started kicking off uh i was talking to a guy at work and um he's like yeah i don't believe in you know this bigfoot stuff and all that i'm like that's fine i said uh um you believe in ufos though right and he's like no i don't believe in ufos i'm like well the government says that the ufos are real like uh, so if the government's saying it's real and he's the kind of guy that's like you know that kind of guy and he's like, I just don't believe it. And I said, all right, well, I said, I'm trying to find something the guy believes in, right? And so I said to him, I said, you're a Christian, right? And he said, yeah. And I said, so you, you believe that that Thank demons you. demons are real, right? And he's like, he goes, uh, no, I don't believe demons are real. I'm like, are angels real? And he's like, yeah. I'm like, but demons aren't real? And he's like, no. I'm like, oh, uh, d dude, like <laughs> you can't just pick and choose what you yeah. want to believe, right? Like it's some, there's got to be some kind of logic yeah. behind it. <laughs> Yeah, you you read my mind. I was going to say these are the kind of people that every you know one day a week they go to a building and they listen to what the preacher man you know says. Hey, God is this angels, demons, blah blah blah. Trust me, bro. But wait a minute, you won't trust someone who's actually witnessed something, but you'll trust hypothetically or theoretically, you'll trust your immortal soul with what some other fallible human being is saying to you because he's in a position of authority. Yeah, you're right. That's not, that's why I find and uh, you know a naysayer who also happens to be an atheist to be much more honest than the person who happens to be religious saying that all this stuff is fake. But for that very reason, you know, that we we've just been then saying or there's the other side of it. Uh it's all evil. I don't want to see UFOs. I don't want to see, you know, it's all evil. It's all evil. It's all of the devil. You know, that's the other knee jerk kind of reaction some people have because this stuff is scary. It's weird to have these experiences. And folks, there is, there is bad out there. There are evil beings and, and, and things like that, that are out, um, you know, out there and don't have your best interest at heart. Um, I, I, you know, like you mentioned with the, uh, I believe in angels, but I don't believe in demons folks. I'm like, uh, okay, <laughs> <laughs> I can't help you. Good luck. <laughs> right. Yeah. So it's scary. Oh yeah. I mean, it, it, everybody's an individual. They have these, these perspectives and, uh, I, it's just, I find it interesting, but, um, 
So uh, before we get out of here, let's just uh, let the people know again where they can find your books. Not just you know the book we were talking today, but you know you're one of you know twenty thousand books. I'm looking at them now. <laughs> well, I've I've written uh, eighteen, and I think uh, well a couple of those are, are are novels. But read the time travel novel. You'll find things in there that I experienced and have researched that I can't really justify putting in nonfiction, but that's at walterbosley.com slash shop. Okay. And anything of mine that is not over there yet, you can go directly to Lulu, L-U-L-U.com and find that. And also I have a, a live stream at YouTube that now we go a couple of times a week at the Walter Bosley channel at YouTube. So check that out. Definitely, especially tomorrow's show, because you already hinted at it. So check it out, because by the time people hear this, it'll be in the archive. So go and you can, right after this episode, you can go check that out. It, it Yeah, it'll be the Transtemporal Cosmic Mysticism episode with Cameron Pasha, the uh, screenwriter author. I'm real excited to have him in this discussion. Awesome. Well, uh, Walter, I appreciate it again, you hopping on with me. This has been an a awesome conversation. I hope people enjoy it. Well, thank you. I've enjoyed it, and I look forward to doing this again. Well, that's the show, everybody. I really hope you enjoyed it. And if you did enjoy it, share the show with your friends and your enemies. I don't care who you share the show with. Just share the freaking show. If you really don't like somebody, send them this show because it's a guaranteed way to keep them from not liking you. Share this weird stuff with them. They'll never talk to you again. So people you love, share it. People you hate, share it. Just share the show. All right, friends, I hope your 2024 is off to a banger of a heater. This is going to be an awesome year. I hope you're geared up for it. And until next week, stay safe, take care, and remember, the truth will set you free, but first it'll piss you off. Bye. Things look a little different when I look at the heavens. Glow from the brush strokes leave a different impression. Behind the holy water, all I'm seeing is devils. Used to stop at the sixes, now I push to the sevens. This is my confession. Whoa, whoa, whoa. The lights around me beckon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm lost in my reflection. No, no, no. I ain't trying to go away, yo. I don't know if I'm caught up in the lights on the mesa. They're so bright. Makes me think about life. In the desert, that's swallowing me whole. I'm just trying to cruise on a trail. But I know that. People look at me, they look for something they can define I just never knew a box I couldn't decline I never thought of being one of a kind I just spent my time elevating my mind This is my confession, whoa, whoa, whoa The lights around me beckon, yeah, yeah, yeah I'm Lost in my reflection, no, no, no I ain't trying to go away, yo I don't know if I'm caught up in the lights on the mesa They're so bright Makes me think about life In the desert that's swallowing me whole I'm just trying to cruise on a trail But I know that my scream Is written in a way That won't make it easy for me, I know So bright